The final race of Formula E's 10th season is this weekend. We're speaking with the series CEO and how it's growing through its adolescent stages. It's Monday, July 15th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. I'm joined now by Jeff Dodds, CEO of Formula E. Welcome, Jeff. Owen, thank you for having me. Great to have you on. So you took over as CEO in May of last year. How would you mm. describe the, the state of the business when you came in? Well, I think it was in pretty good shape, uh, to be honest with you. I think the business had been growing for uh, about nine years. Um, it was probably in kind of its second phase of growth, I would say. The, the first stage is a startup business. Any startup business is, is kind of survival. And, and it's no different in motorsport. You know, it's a, it's a heavy capital business. So a lot of investment coming into the organization, um, trying to secure partners and sponsors and teams and manufacturers and pay for racetracks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it very much, um, and not all businesses do, but it, it, it survived that period, started to put some early growth numbers on the board. Then all of a sudden lockdown came along and, and COVID-19 and, you know, just kind of stalled it at a point where momentum was really starting to kick in. Um, and then the business had to regroup and start to grow again. And I guess I joined just as it was in that kind of uh, regrouping, um, regrowing period. Um, but it was in pretty good shape. It, it had momentum. One thing's for sure about this business, I mean, it has massive, massive upside, massive potential. Um, so we were seeing uh, um, growth in fan base, uh, growth in media, um, the calendar was developing and getting stronger over time. Um, certainly the racing car itself was was developing and, and starting to show better performance. I was into the, the first year of Generation 3, which was uh, the latest generation of racing cars. So, so no, when I joined, it was in, it was in, in pretty good shape. Um, and I was just super excited when I looked at the, the potential available from the series. Yeah, and when you speak to that growth potential, is it as simple as racing is is you know as hot as it's ever been and electric cars are as hot as they've ever been you've got a young audience is it just those basic ingredients um i smiled when you said the word simple because nothing <laughs> nothing is simple in motorsport and nothing is simple in business and therefore i get the double whammy in a motorsports business um so the things that i think are very helpful for our organization is um we have the tailwind of electrification so um, electric cars and the footprint of electric cars growing every year. When this business was formed, Owen, there was only 300,000 electric vehicles sold in the year that the business was formed 10 years ago. Um, uh, this year, there'll probably be between 18 and 20 million electric vehicles sold. So we have that tailwind of electrification. And of course, that's only getting stronger because most developed countries in the world have, have said that by 2030, uh, 2035, sorry, you won't be able to buy a new vehicle that's not electric or alternative fuel. So we have that wonderful tailwind. Um, you're quite right, though. The second thing, though, is around um, motorsport and the interest in motorsport. Uh, and certainly we've been helped by kind of the resurgence of Formula One through Drive to Survive and, and the growth it's showing in North America. Um, so those two things together. And the other unique factor we have is that we, we're a business that's been net zero from day zero. We have a very strong platform around sustainability, which is becoming more and more important over time and more interesting over time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's all those things coming together. And the point you made on fan base, I think, is um, is a good point of difference for us. So as an organization, our fan base, um, largely 50-50 split male-female, which is completely unique in motorsports. Um, and around half our fan base under the age of 40. So we have a, a much younger, more gender split fan base. So I think um, I think that's provided us opportunities for growth that don't necessarily exist in more traditional motorsport. Yeah, and I wanted to ask about that gender split. Um, is that something, like, how did that happen exactly? I mean, in, in women's sports, it's one thing when it's, you know, women are on the field or the court, um, but in, in sports when it's still men doing the competing, I don't know of a sport where, I mean, I don't know the numbers for all the sports, but I think one generally assumes it's it's still pretty male dominated on in the fan base side. How is it that you've got a close to a 50-50 split? Yeah, look, I don't know it was ever fully by design. 
I mean, so I don't think someone sat down when they formed the business and said, let's aim for a, uh, a complete gender split. Um, what they probably did recognize was the opportunity for a younger fan base um, because we're, we're emerging technology. So I've got uh, my two boys, 15 years old, 13 year old, um, they'll, they'll probably never drive an internal combustion engine car. So they'll probably only ever drive an electric vehicle. Um, and therefore, uh, as we came into this, um, developing this series, we would have recognized that our product, our technology is more likely to appeal to the next generation as opposed to the, the, the previous generation. Um, but there are a few things, I think, that help us when it comes to um, uh, of bringing more women into, um, into the interest of, of Formula E. One, we tend to race in iconic cities around the world. So we're not a drive out of town to a big traditional motorsports venue. You know, you can be a casual observer, a casual fan watching this in the center of Tokyo or watching this in the center of London or at Tempelhof in the center of Berlin. So we're a city center racing series. That's how we've grown up. Um, strong focus on sustainability. And, and that doesn't just mean environmental sustainability, but it also means social sustainability, which we know is a um, uh, uh, is a, of interest to both men and women, uh, particularly young men and women. Um, and we're a high technology business. So we're, we treat the racetrack as a laboratory to develop next generation iterations of electric vehicle technology. So, so you put together racing in city centers, very strong focus on social, social and environmental sustainability and, um, and a focus on next generation technology. And I think that just appeals, naturally appeals to a younger um, uh, gender split audience. Mm. So everywhere we race, so if we're racing in, um, in Portland as we are here or um, when we're in Berlin, we're working, we, we have a, um, uh, a fund called Better Futures Foundation or Better Futures Fund. And what that means is we work with organizations in the areas that we race to provide a positive social legacy when we leave. So that could be working with charities that are focused on disadvantaged um, uh, people in the community. The example I often cite is, is because it, it just springs to mind, is Rome of last year. When we were in Rome, um, there were three things that we, we were able to support. One was the regeneration of the local playgrounds in, in the city of Rome that had been closed down during lockdown. So getting them back up and running so that so that young families and people with young families could, could get back outside and start to enjoy the local outdoors environment in Rome. The second was we identified that there were accident hotspots in, in Rome, particularly at night on the roads of Rome. So we were able to put up some, uh, solar lighting around those areas of the city to try and support uh, visibility late at night. And the third thing was we worked with the local prison service um, to bring prisoners at, who were due for release shortly out to work with us on the on the development and construction of the site in Rome and to work on on making fans for fans for fans because it was 40 odd degree and providing shelter for fans. So when we leave the city, we want to leave some form of lasting social legacy. So that when I talk about um, social sustainability, it's making sure that wherever we have a where we have a footprint, wherever we touch, we leave it in in a slightly better place than when we arrive. Yeah, and I feel like that sort of thing ought to be you know something that especially the leagues that travel that go from place to place, you know, ought to be thinking about being good guests because as much as it brings economic activity, on the flip side of that is it brings a lot of disruption to you know to drop a race everywhere you go. Yeah, so so right, and um, our partners are so supportive of this. So, if I, a, a good example is something like Alliance. So, Alliance is one of our big partners. They provide for us something called the hydration station, uh, and I think, and the numbers, and Charlotte will will, will I'm sure will uh, fact check the numbers for me. Um, but I think it's something like four hundred and fifty thousand pieces of single use plastic have been avoided through the use of these giving out bottles and having hydration stations all the way around um, our race locations. Um, all of our races are, are, are powered by HVO, so hydrogenated vegetable oil, um, so sustainable fuels. All of this stuff is stuff that we take incredibly seriously because we've been net zero from day zero. That doesn't just mean our race cars are zero emissions, because they are, but it also means we focus on every individual element of when we bring the circus to town to make sure it has the least positive, least possible negative impact and that we leave it in a better place when we leave the city. Uh, Liberty Global is buying Warner Bros. Discovery's shares of Formula E. Will hold sixty five percent of its uh, of of the whole company. Uh, what's that going to mean for the business? 
Yeah, so I actually came out of Liberty Global. So I was the COO of one of their largest businesses, Virgin Media O2, based in the UK, big telco business. Um, so I've known the organization and worked with them for a number of years. And, and it was effectively them um, uh, that I discussed the Formula E opportunity with, and, and, and th that was my path into, into this role. Um, I think Warner Brothers Discovery and Liberty are at quite different stages of their strategic um, uh, roadmap versus when they first invested in the business, because they both invested in the business actually in 2015. So they've been long loyal partners, both Warner Brothers Discovery and Liberty Global. Obviously, Lib uh, when Discovery first invested, it was Discovery. They weren't then Warner Brothers Discovery. That was only a couple of years ago that that, that merger went through. Um, and li back then, Liberty Global were very much focused on, uh, on global telecoms and media assets. Since then, they've developed a large ventures portfolio. I think it's valued at about three billion US dollars now. A large ventures portfolio, which is focused on fast growth businesses. So I think the timing of this was was kind of good for both for both shareholders, both investors. Um, Liberty particularly are are interested in in this ventures portfolio, uh, and I think they see Formula E as a as a fast growth stock for them. The two things that Mike Fries, who's the CEO of Liberty, said um, said when the announcement was made that that you love to hear when you're the chief exec, right? The two things he said were, I he believed that Formula E needed two things to be successful from its investment partner, so from its major shareholder, it needed conviction and it needed capital. And in Liberty Global, we have a partner that has a conviction in our to deliver our plan. They they, they are convinced that our growth plan. Uh, is achievable, and they believe that the strategy and the pathway we see to get there is the right pathway. The second thing is they have the capital to support that growth plan. So as a chief exec, when someone's saying to you, you're being really ambitious and we believe you can deliver that, and we like the pathway you've laid out strategically to get there, and we're gonna support you with the capital to allow you to push um, to make that happen, that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing. I think um, often businesses, and I'm not saying this is us, but often businesses try to um, to cost save their way to growth. And I think absolutely we have to be very cautious and only spend and invest our money where we can get a return on that investment or a long term return on that investment. On the other hand, we're a business that's only 10 years old and we're competing in, in an industry where we have. Formula One at 75 years old and IndyCar at 100 years old and all these all these competitors that have been around for a very long time and are well established. So we need to invest to grow uh, and Liberty Global are a brilliant partner to do that with. So Liberty Global and Liberty Media are not the same thing, but they are connected. And so is there any, will this produce any you know opportunities or possibilities of any cross-pollination with F1 with this new partner or are you still pretty separate? Uh, so we're connected in a sense that, um, uh, you know, within John Malone's kind of business empire, you have three businesses. You have um, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, you have Liberty Global, you have Liberty Media, run as completely separate businesses. So who knows whether in the future it presents an opportunity for synergy, whether that's growth synergies or, or cost synergies, who knows? But, um, but certainly that's not the intention. So that wasn't the intention of the of Liberty Global taking the larger stakes. So, um, no, we are a Liberty Global business, and um, and Liberty Global is a very separate business to Liberty Media. And I mean, it, it does sort of speak to the. I think a lot of casual people just assume there's some connection between F1 and Formula E, uh, especially now that you're both owned by something that starts with Liberty and owned by John Malone. Um, is there any? Anything you have to do as a business to separate yourself from Formula One? Because I imagine, you know, it, it helps that Formula One's growing. There's just more general interest in racing. At the same time, they might be taking up, you know, more of the oxygen. Uh, then you obviously have NASCAR, IndyCar, all those. Um, so, so yeah, to, to what degree are you sort of helped and hurt by the presence of, of F1? So the first thing I would say is there's, I believe there's more than enough oxygen um, for two world championship single seater motor series to exist in the world. You know, Formula One has about 800 million fans around the world um, based on our, our research. Uh, we have around 400 million fans around the world. Um, and the crossover actually is not as large as you might think. We, they're, they're quite, as we talked about earlier, they're quite separate audiences, quite different audiences tuning in to those two, to those two sports. Um, clearly what helps us is that Formula One provides a point of comparison for us. 
So whether that's emissions and carbon impact that we're able to compare Formula E to Formula One, whether it's acceleration and we launch our Gen 3 Evo car, we launched it in Monaco, it'll be on the track in, in December, um, that's 30% faster in acceleration to a Formula One car. So they provide a, Formula One has been seen as the pinnacle of motorsport forever, and therefore it's great that I have a comparison for Formula E. So I can talk about we're faster accelerating than a Formula One car, or that we produce X times less carbon than, than, Formula, e, than Formula One. So they provide a brilliant point of comparison. They also, to some degree, have provided a bit of a roadmap for what successful strategy looks like, because there's things that Formula One have done that have really um, energized their growth. So whether that's uh, more races in North America, whether it's streaming series to bring more profile to the team principals and the drivers like Drive to Survive, they've, they've shown us things that can have a positive impact on the sport. So um, I'm actually personally a big Formula One fan. I've grown up as a, as a keen viewer of Formula One, follow the teams, follow the drivers. So I'm a fan of Formula One. Certainly neither series needs to, to, to lose for the other to win, in my opinion. There's more than enough room for both of these series to be successful. Um, but, I, but for me, it's nice to have a, a kind of 75-year-old pinnacle of motorsport to compare myself to, particularly um, when the technology that underpins those, to those two sports, one is a, is a technology that's internal combustion engine technology, um, been around since 1896, the Otto engine is 130 years old. It's been iterated to within an inch of its life. Um, and the other is a technology that's really only been seen on the road since 2008. So very much in its infancy with a load more development improvement to come from electric vehicle technology. So the fact that I have the tailwind of technology, that's effectively their headwind in technology. I'll give you an interesting statistic. Um, Formula One's cost cap is around 140 million US dollars a year for the teams. Ours is about 14 million US dollars a year. So about 10% of, so there's about 10% of the cost involved in, in running a Formula E team. Um, and the global fan base is about half the size. So that, that gives you an idea of kind of the growth we're seeing and the investment required to see that growth. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of, you know, the investment that your manufacturers are putting in, um, you know, one of the, the selling points from the manufacturer side for Formula One for a long time was, you know, it's, it's marketing, but it's also R&D. You know, you, you, you put all this money into making the best race car used into the consumer car. Um, and I know that about 70% of the Formula E car is, you know, that's the same from, from car to car. You also have this 30% this that's variable. So yeah, to what degree um, is it, is there that same proposition of, these manufacturers, you know, they're all making EVs. Can they use their Formula E research to inform their, their consumer research? So, so look, all manufacturers and teams are in it for a slightly different reason. So they, they'll, all, um, they'll all want to get slightly different things out of their investment. But you're absolutely right. As far as we're concerned, the racetrack is a laboratory, a laboratory where manufacturers can test and learn around powertrain efficiency, battery efficiency, the, uh, software efficiency, they can test and learn. And, and we have multiple examples we can cite for across manufacturers like Nissan, Jaguar, Porsche, where they've developed technology on the racetrack or learned something on the racetrack and put it straight into their road car development. So there are multiple examples of that. So that puts pressure on me. It means we have to be at the absolute forefront of EV technology in order for them to be able to learn things. But look, a great example of that would be if I talk about someone like Jaguar, you know, Jaguar learned something about the efficiency between powertrain and battery on the racetrack because they're always they're always looking for ways to make the car more efficient. If you remember, the cars start a Formula E race with only about 60 percent of the energy they need to complete the race. The other 40 percent will come through regeneration of the battery during the race. Efficiency, therefore, becomes an absolutely key factor. Um, and Jaguar learned something that they were able to take from the racetrack through an over-the-air update, update the software in their iPACE road car range. And if you were an iPACE owner, you'd, you went to bed and you woke up in the morning after that over-the-air update and you had 35 kilometers more range available to you on your battery. That for me, those stories when I hear those are amazing. We'll leave it there. Jeff Dodds, thank you so much for joining us on the show. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.
That's it for today. Rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts or throw us a like on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.